Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined by uh, a celebrity around learning and media and uh, someone who's really doing fascinating work at uh, UPenn's Positive Psychology Program. And uh, we'll get into lots of uh, the real more intricate aspects of Howard's background when uh, we get into the conversation. But to begin with, I'd just love to welcome Howard Blumenthal to Trending in Education. Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So where to begin? So you're someone who's been deeply involved in learning and thinking about uh, kids, thinking about the future for many years. And we always like to begin the conversation by hearing in, in my guest's own world, words, your origin story. So how did you get to where you are today? And feel free to ex be expansive in your conversation because you've had a pretty storied career. It starts out probably at about age five. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was just beginning to be a producer at NBC. He produced a very popular game show series called Concentration. Mm. And I grew up at NBC in New York. Mm. So I was able to wander in and out of studios. If we don't tell the senior executives, I would sometimes sit on the lap of a technical director and switch the network live as a seven-year-old. Wow. So I was really, I was in and out and watched rehearsals and all sorts of game shows, talk shows, election coverage, space shoots, you name it. Yeah. Everything was really happening there. And it was really exciting because it was all in one building. So all I had to do is hop in the elevator, go from the eighth floor where Saturday Night Live is now to radio, which I think was on the fourth floor, if I remember correctly. And I would just sit in the radio studios. People knew who I was. They were fascinated by the fact that this 11 year old or whatever <laughs> wanted to be on the air with them. And they would allow me to do that. So uh -huh. it was a great place to begin to learn. Around that time, my aunt and uncle, she from Germany, he, a former military guy who, who, who marries her and comes back, and they're very international. They're as international as our family got, right, yep, yep. Uh, at the time. Family came from Eastern Europe and all that, but this is a next generation. Mm -hmm. And they got me a book called Faces Looking Up, which mm -hmm. was stories about individual kids growing up in different parts of the world after World War II. So it was already an older book when I got my hands on it. Yep. So here's a kid from Japan and another from Egypt and another from Iran. And they had like alphabets in it and little sketches of what the kids' lives were like and stories about it. And I was captivated by it. I just thought it was so cool. Now, I'm nine years old. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a whole lot of life experience at that yeah. point. But I had a sense that there was this world out there. I also collected stamps, mm. which meant I had little tiny pictures of parts of the world with funny names on them. I didn't realize you're a philatelist. I think, you know, at the moment I was. Yeah, yeah. And it just opened the idea that England or Brazil mm -hmm. or British colonies existed mm -hmm. and that they had some history. So it's just a very good introduction, right? Yep, yep. So years later, so we go through college and inevitably I'm running the college newspaper and, and the radio station and, the, and all that. And along the way, I'm learning how not to manage because I did a terrible job. I apologize to everybody, <laughs> but learning by doing ended up being a really important part of that, particularly in media, because mm -hmm. if you are on the radio, if you are doing a talk show, as I would do interview shows on the radio as well as the disc jockey stuff. Yep. And, uh, and again, for those who listened, I don't think it was a very good disc jockey either, but there we are. It was a great opportunity to try things, to experiment, to see whether we could get people to laugh. So mm -hmm, one, of, one of our proudest achievements was staging a parade on the main street of this small town. And we created a track the crowds and music and the parade didn't exist. Mm. We did the whole thing as a theater of the mind ah, thing. Very cool. But we did it as live parade coverage and people actually went to Main Street to see the parade. That's a little War of the Worlds, right? It's yeah. I mean, and Wells. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Just goofy, yeah. but it told me that I could play with media, that mm -hmm. it was malleable. Mm -hmm. And I worked on a game show at ABC and then another uh, while all of that activity was still in New York. Mm -hmm. And then I was hired to work at this funny little division of Warner Communications within the world of emerging cable television. Mm -hmm. And they needed a channel for teenagers mm -hmm. and a channel for children. So I led the team initially for what becomes MTV much later mm -hmm. and also worked on the team for Nickelodeon. Wow. And again, 
the idea that we could do things that were different from NBC, CBS, ABC, and I knew what they were doing in NBC pretty well, mm -hmm. allowed me the opportunity to try things. Yeah. And now to have a staff mm. to try things. We had several studios that we built and we would do six hours a day of live programming. Right. Again, most of it, not Emmy award winning, but that's <laughs> sure. okay yeah. because we were learning the craft and we were learning how to do this. And that really establishes the bed for we can play with technology because we had we scanned every household every six seconds so we had a lot of computer technology there yeah. at mm -hmm. the time and uh, this was local in columbus ohio to about thirty thousand homes okay. those people were the ones who i did started developing early computer games with they're mm -hmm. the ones who a lot of the core of the team for where in the world is carmen san diego and a lot of the reasons why i ended up producing that show mm -hmm. were because i met dorothy then curly now tecklenburg there and we mm -hmm. worked on a bunch of different projects together including with another guy since past who was a puppeteer mm -hmm. so the three of us got together we decided what the world needed was a complete guide to time travel Wow. So we created a nonfiction book about time travel mm -hmm. that allowed us to understand how you create an artificial made up environment an imagined yeah. environment. Sounds we, like a lot of, sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. We just laughed the whole time. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that set up the, we could create an imagined environment around the Carmen San Diego concept. Mm -hmm. And that's where the detective office and the sort of loopy nature of, we have a host who for whatever reasons doesn't know where the crooks are, but everybody else in the world seems to know where they are. Like, right, right. like those kinds of weird pretzel logic yeah. um, ended up being the source of a lot of humor on mm -hmm. the show. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the reason why it succeeded. Yeah. Would we have gotten there had we not gone through those exercises? Absolutely not. And it was still ridiculously impossible today, which is October 13th, New York Times published an article about 50 years of PBS and 50 reasons why PBS is great or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, Carmen Sandiego is on that list of nice. 50. We're number yeah. 19. Mm -hmm. So I was writing this morning, I think on Facebook, and I'm thinking if we could get Carmen's crooks <laughs> to somehow steal Julia Child and Barney, we would go up to positions. Yes, like yes. That was just the way we thought, right? I'm sure, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. So a lot of this was like, if we're not giggling, if we're not having fun, what's the point? And mm -hmm. I think that was a lot of the reason why the show succeeded. Mm -hmm. But for me, it went back to the early stamp collecting and the book right. and all right. that stuff about curiosity about the world and mm -hmm. trying to share my curiosity with others, right? particularly with the next generation of kids. And, you know, I, I would half jokingly say that I had a 10 year old who lived inside my head and told me <laughs> which decisions to make in the control room because right, right. we, we just, you develop a relationship with the material and the audience mm -hmm. and you just go for it. One yeah. of the reasons that I think distance learning doesn't work is they don't have 200 people on staff mm -hmm. to focus on one subject for a half hour. And that's where they're competing against because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can as easily watch a Zoom boring thing yeah. with a teacher I know, or I can flip the channel and now oh. I've got, it's not even channels anymore. It's whatever the internet wants to call them. Right. There's just so many different ways to learn now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once I started realizing, and this is early like AOL and CompuServe and yep. if, 90 or, something. Yeah. 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 A after Carmen, mm -hmm. I realized this is all going to change. We're not going to learn in the same ways that we learned before, mm -hmm. but because of my relationships in Silicon Valley, in particular on the kid's side, and also my relationships elsewhere, I was a little bit ahead of the curve, like yep. a millimeter ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And I had been writing a syndicated newspaper column for the New York Times Syndicate and United Features for about 100 newspapers about consumer technology. Okay. So I had the tremendous advantage of being well known. If I had a question or I wanted to just riff on what might be happening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I had complete access to yeah. through public relations people and stuff. I was able to really develop a vision of what the future might look like. Yeah. And I was able to do that early and I was able to do it in fanciful ways because I had access and because uh -huh. I was curious and because I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It sounds like uh, you're a great example of the, the 10,000 hours idea of just being immersed in these media capabilities from the time you were uh, a boy 
to the point where you really had the mastery of all the different component trees so that you were able to innovate through Carmen San Diego, but then also there's another 20 plus years since Carmen San Diego that I'd love to hear uh, you expand upon too. So what have you been up to? First off, thank you for your service as someone who was a little older, but I still saw Carmen San Diego. I got to say, maybe my 10 year old kid was alive in me, but I still enjoyed it as an adult, which I think is a credit to the quality of the content there. But since the days of Carmen San Diego, you've you haven't sat idle. You've explored quite a few different areas. So can you give us a, a quick update on what's happened since then? Yeah. So post Carmen, the WGBH really wanted me to do a follow on series, mm -hmm. and they just make it up. And we'll sell it to PBS and put it on the air. So they were interested in doing Wear in Time, which would be a history show, mm -hmm. and as I spend time developing that. I realized it would have to be a costume show and the costumes mm -hmm. would be very expensive. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I didn't think that we would find ongoing underwriting support for it because mm -hmm. there's an imperative about knowing where things are in the world, but that doesn't exist for history, right. nor does it exist quite for math. Yep. Uh, science, some, but I, but again, being fanciful about science means a lot of visualizations yeah. and a lot of animations that I thought would not be within the realm of the budget. I started, and they also were interested in bringing Zoom back, which they did. They also did a version of Where in Time. Uh, and um, Zoom, Zoom, the, the PBS show, yeah, the, not, not the, the Zoom uh, software, right. which we're all living in these right. days. Or yeah. the Zoom portable audio recorders that we're all using. To yes, exactly. Use Zoom it. is a very, it's a very right. hot term. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. But on the subject of Zoom, completely irrelevant. My first exposure to the word was actually the Zoomar lens, mm. which allowed studio television cameras not to be three turrets with three separate lenses, close up, mm. medium and telephoto, wide angle telephoto and all that. Huh. But instead, you could push a lever Mm -hmm. And you could gradually zoom in. And we all thought it was a miracle. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it so was. That was my, yeah. that was my yeah. first encounter with the, yeah. the yeah. technology use of zoom. Anyway, so, because you would zoom in on something, right? Sure. That was yeah. The, yeah. Or zoom out. All right. So now I'm looking at this whole thing. I'm thinking I'd really rather be in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be inventing part of the future. And I ended up working with a company called Kidsoft that had a membership club for kids that involved the new PC-based or Mac-based uh, uh, games, including yep. Carmen and Oregon Trail and yep. Reader Rather and all that. Mm -hmm. So I became very expert in that industry for a while. We built yeah. a company, we sold it to Hearst mm -hmm. for a little bit of money, not a tremendous yeah. amount of money. And that allowed me a very different set of relationships. It allowed me to interact with people in Silicon Valley, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and also to learn what a startup was and how mm -hmm. a startup and a large company interacted. So I ended up working with Hearst, which was the acquiring company for a while, yep. trying to figure out the software business for them. Mm -hmm. And I did a few other things like that. I'm thinking, I'd like to work in this environment. I'd like to work in a corporate environment and see what that feels like. Sure. So after setting up another and then another television production company to, to build shows for Food Network and History Channel and a bunch of others, some with my old Carmen crew, mm -hmm. um, I thought it, it would be interesting to be part of a larger company. So there was a, CD, a startup called CD Now. It was in the music space. Okay. And it was the largest music site on earth. We were the 39th largest website. We had a big audience. Yeah. And there was a media operation that was scattered. So we pulled it all together under me. We added public relations and business development and advertising and, and a bunch of other services that had begun. I just consolidated them. Yep. And I ended up running the front of the house, all the sort of front facing stuff. There was a tech, very strong technology group in the back. Yeah. And we sold that company to Bertelsmann. And that began, if you follow the threads, ultimately leads to Apple and, and iMusic, although I wasn't involved in Got it. You know that, but that's how that jukebox concept becomes mm -hmm. iTunes and all mm -hmm. that. So we were at the beginning of that. Napster was involved. In. Uh -huh. uh, so it was fun being an executive, but I was drawn to, well, we have huge audiences now for these little tiny videos that we're delivering via dial up. Yeah. So that led to short form productions that led to time in public television mm -hmm. initially as a board member and then as somebody to run what really was just about the most innovative public television operation because of the structure of public television. I really wanted to experiment with short form 
but with a very specific learning agenda. So I started thinking, what is the most successful thing that, that public television has done in learning? And could we take that kind of thinking and start essentially establish a new territory on the internet mm -hmm. for public media that wouldn't necessarily have to be PBS because public media involves more than PBS. Mm -hmm. They'd be welcome. And we create sort of a workshop and we would take on big subjects. For example, America's relationship with guns, mm. but we could do this with puppets. So I started working with some of the people from Sesame wow. yeah. and we started playing around with the mythology we hear on the news all the time. Wonder what the reality is. Mm. How many animals are harmed or killed by guns every year? Wow. Yeah. I would think probably more than humans. Mm -hmm. So they might have an opinion about this. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we give them a platform? And if sure. we're using puppets, we can do that. Uh -huh. So we started developing essentially sketches that would allow us to warp time and space a bit mm -hmm. so that animals could talk sure. so that we could have a very serious conversation between a puppet wolf and the president of a university, which we did for like a half hour. Wow. Um, so we just went for it. Yeah. At the time I learned about the United Nations, then millennium development goals. Hmm. And we were surprised me and Dorothy, cause she's involved in this again, by how little we knew about it. We're talking about eradicating extreme poverty in the world and yeah. Americans know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. we're like this is really weird. Why? Yeah. News media doesn't quite pick up the story. Maybe we ought to develop another means for people to learn. Maybe we ought to learn it ourselves because we knew very little. Yeah. And we started taking on these big topics and it was fascinating. I had a few university friends. I was at MIT and Harvard and yeah. Penn and a bunch of others just hanging out with scholars saying, how do you guys think about this? Because I'm like, at one point I was writing jokes for the first Cartoon Network original series. Like I can write jokes for a mouse, not that well, but I can do it. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, Bobcat Goldthwait. It was yeah, his, he was called sure. Moxie and he had a sidekick. I was writing for, I was rewriting the sidekick stuff. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Penn Teller, who's the one who talks? Teller. Uh, talks, right? Yes. Yes. So I was writing for Teller because he was. Ah, uh -huh. there so, you go. There you go. I'm like, do you guys seriously want me at the university? Because do you really want me? You're going to allow me in, right? <laughs> and um, it became, why don't you come in as, as a scholar? Why don't uh -huh. you come in as initially a visiting scholar mm -hmm. at the Annenberg School for Communication at University of Pennsylvania? That morphed into going over to the Positive Psychology Center. Yes. Because I realized that what I was doing, and I'll explain in a minute, was talking to kids around the world about how human progress works in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's interesting, but I need a university around me to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I just, I need somebody who really understands population studies and migration and all these other ideas. Yeah. So I want to integrate knowledge across a bunch of different disciplines related specifically to people who will live their entire lives in the 21st century. Got it. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not quite what universities do because they tend to go very specific and deep and I'm going very wide. Yeah. But let me go. So I yeah. went to Uganda. A friend of mine has a, an NGO there and he took care of me and he set up schools for me to go and talk to. But I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what yeah. the project would be. Uh -huh. And uh, I started talking to kids in groups and this and a small configuration. And eventually he's like, you know what? If I stay off camera, which is my preference. Yeah. And... I asked the kid, let's call him a 14 year old, a question about what he's thinking about. What is his life all about? What does he want to do in the future? Why, what are the plans and all that? And these guys were so articulate and so well-informed and such a complete joy that I'm like, I probably should do this some more. So I was on the way back and I, I stopped in Hong Kong I didn't have kids. I didn't have a camera. And I'm not like, I'm not the guy you would hire to actually touch a camera. Right, right? Right. I'm the guy who you would hire to hire somebody. Yeah, to touch a camera, sure. right? uh -huh. But okay. So I figured out how to do it. I'm making phone calls from my hotel room, 12 hours off or whatever to friends in the U S going. So it says settings. <laughs> what does this mean? Yeah. Um, but we managed to do it. And I interviewed a bunch of kids in Hong Kong. And mm. then I went, Oh, I don't really know what to do with this. Cause I'm really not an editor. Right. Right. And I don't really know how to put a website together with video. I got to learn how to do all this. And, and slowly but surely I did. I brought it to a conference, a global children's media conference in 
in England sponsored by the BBC and told people what I was doing. And all yeah. of a sudden, children's media people are like, that's a good idea. What's a good idea? Like, go talk to kids in different places. <laughs> okay. Is that mm -hmm. a good, I'm not the hundredth guy who's done that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Maybe you're doing it differently, but whatever mm -hmm. you're doing, it looks good. Yeah. So, keep to, so begins Kids on Earth which mm -hmm. people can find by visiting www.kidsonearth.org. Okay. And there are now almost a thousand mm. uh, video segments from hundreds of interviews that I've done in mm. India, uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Slovenia, England, Kentucky, the list goes on. Wow. And in every case, what they told me is different from what they learn in school for the most part. Right. They're not thinking about math, science, and all that. They're thinking about their bodies and their mind and yeah. their relationships. So I started thinking, that's odd, right? That, that they're using different terminology, but their interests go further. Is this because of the internet? Mm -hmm. mm, somewhat. Yeah. It's because of the way they're learning and the permission we've given them, the freedom that the 21st century provides. Mm whether it's identity or it's feeling whole or yep. it's trying to understand their mental health issues. Cause now 25% of people in the United States who are under, we have, we have problems there. Yeah. Yeah. So I started thinking about this. Is there a way to tell this story, to tell their story in a unified way? And I started working on a book hmm. and as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, this is a really wonderful story. And it's also a story with a great many surprises. For example, most people, let's call it 2050, in the world will be living in Africa mm -hmm. and in South Asia. Yes. Thinking nobody knows this. This is right. not something. So I start going out to universities as I'm doing the interviews in Paraguay. I'm also lecturing at universities. Mm -hmm. And I've got professors who now are like putting down their cell phones and listening to me. And again, I'm the guy who I'm not exactly the guy I thought they would listen to. Mm -hmm. And I'm explaining how the world really looks in 2050 and where the major cities are and how yeah. all population trends are shifting and how in the United States, we are very likely to have 25% Latino, 25% mm -hmm. European, 25% African, Mm -hmm. And what did I leave out? Twenty five percent Asian. Mm -hmm. So it, our more perfect union, yeah. it, it doesn't look like majorities. It looks like a real blend. Yep, yep. The reason for that is because our population is aging very rapidly. We need replacements. They're not coming from new babies because our replacement rate is quite low. Yep. So it has to come from somewhere else. That somewhere else is going to be South Asia and Africa in mm -hmm. large numbers. Mm -hmm. So. Once you start thinking about the implications of that, mm -hmm. this conversation goes way beyond interviewing a 10 year old kid in India. Right. Now we have context. Right. Yeah. And that gets me excited because now there's a real story and some meaning behind the work that I'm doing. So yeah. I'm breather here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. And, and it's interesting also to see the through lines of the books you read as a child, Carmen, the, your interest in stamps, Carmen San Diego. And then in some ways you, you were becoming Carmen San Diego to a certain extent, spanning the globe, talking to kids and expanding your mindset and then applying those skills back to educate the rest of us on things we may not understand. What's it been like to, to be involved in producing these types of media products over that span of time? What kind of trends have you noticed? What kind of consistencies have you seen really throughout the full span of that time? So you and I are talking via Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's talking via Zoom. Yes. Everybody has suddenly become a television producer. Mm -hmm. So this is even beyond the idea of I can record you on my iPhone and perhaps edit it. Mm -hmm. Now, everything's live. Yeah. Everything or a, a recording of live. Yes. We all understand backgrounds. We all understand lighting. We're yep. talking about ring lights. We're talking about mm -hmm. external microphones. We're talking mm -hmm. about all sorts of stuff. So just as we've given people permission in desktop publishing, in all of the different media, now television is that which for me as a professional, a yeah. trained, a bigger show kind of television producer. Yeah. You know what? I did it. It's great. If this yeah. is what it is, that's great. Everybody should do it. But it doesn't leave much room for people who learned how to do it in a studio. It's been reinvented. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Now, the weird thing about that is the one big domain 
two actually that have not been reinvented are government mm -hmm. and education. Yep. So education has been remarkably resistant in part because of teachers unions. That's usually yeah. a place we blame, but that's not the problem. The problem is we come into this with assumptions about what school ought to be that are based more or less on the structure that we established for public schools in the early part of the 20th century. Go back further. So what does that mean? It means that we're educating kids on a 20th century framework, right. largely using a 20th century curriculum. But mm -hmm. now there's the internet, there's permissions, they learn from one another. There are all sorts of wizards out there who yeah. can help them to learn. And we don't want to have them use an iPhone in class. But now we're completely reliant, at least a few days a week in many schools on using the sort of a bigger version of the iPhone. We're not going to go backwards. The kids right. know how to do this. The iPhone's out of the barn, whatever mm -hmm. you want to say. <laughs> so now I started thinking, I need to think about this. I need to write about this. I need to understand this. So like you, although I'm a more of a latecomer, I started asking people from all parts of the education world, yeah. what the heck is going on and where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So we created something, Steve Hargaden, who does a, he's an expert in ed tech and has been doing video conferences for years. He and I got together mm -hmm. and we started putting together this thing called reinventing school that we record every Thursday. Mm -hmm. And this week, tomorrow, I'm interviewing three state superintendents. Mm -hmm. Here's why. When I talk to a student, they're like, I don't know if I really want to learn this. I don't know if it's important. So they go to the teacher and say, why do I have to learn this? The teacher says, oh, no, you have to learn it because the principal said it, yeah, we have to do. We have a curriculum and all that. I'm like, who does that? And so the state does that. So I'm like, the state. I can finally talk to the state. I can yeah. find out what this is all about. Yeah. So I know that, you know, I, I have a good sense of what they do. At one point, I was part of a New Jersey state government for a year. Sure. I have a sense of what, you know, of the realm and, and how it works. But if we can understand that a little better, that's helpful. But I also was concerned about cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Like we're really dependent now on this technology yes. to get us through. Mm -hmm. What happens if it goes away? How does that work? Right. Or what happens if you can't afford it? So right. that led to what about rural broadband? How does that work if you're in a place where you don't have this? Mm -hmm. And that led to pods and micro schools because yeah. maybe there's a better way to do it. The thing about pods, and I love learning all this and playing with people as we go, is if you have too many pods and they work, then people are not going to want to pay their school taxes. That changes the economics at a time when states may not have the money to fund the schools. We get into this right. craziness with real estate taxes and people can't pay. So now I'm looking at a much more holistic view of the places that I had been fortunate to visit during Kids on Earth, schools all over the world. Yeah. Because that's where I do the interviews in school libraries because they're quiet. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm getting a much more robust view of what school looks like mm -hmm. and what school could look like. Mm -hmm. So I figured there's no reason why not to, and I've got the benefit of being more on the scholarly side so I can yeah. think. What if it actually could change? What would we want it to become right. in a practical, reasonable way? Mm -hmm. So I started writing, and that's what I've been working on uh, over this period of time, mainly because of a challenge from a, a really brilliant educator at Hunter College named Gina Riley. Okay. Gina just wrote a book called Unschooling that explains the whole homeschooling structure yes. and all mm -hmm. that. She's mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. Because you're not in a position where they can fire you for saying futuristic things about education or logical yeah. things about education, write it down. So I figured, okay, what's the first thing? I guess it's what we learn and how we structure what we learn. And does everybody need to learn the same thing? Because right now school's set up so that most people learn most of the same things in most yeah. of the same ways. So what if most people learn different things in different ways? Right. As in you and I are having a conversation, things I don't know, and I know things you don't know. And that would be why we're having a conversation right, because right. we're learning from each other. Yep. So I'm not sure the opposite works. I'm not sure that it's possible to teach. Yeah. I think it's possible to learn, mm -hmm. but I think those are dramatically different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So if you gave people an opportunity to learn on their own, how would that look? How would yeah. you structure it? Would you still have homerooms? Would you still have schools? Yes. Would you still have teachers? Yeah, but they have to become wizards. They can't 
be subject matter experts. Yeah. And we know this because we're talking about it a lot, but the fun is seeing it all as one piece. Yeah. Because you trigger what are the rights that we associate with kids? Mm -hmm. What rights do we grant to kids that we currently deny kids because they're in a school environment? Right. What does that mean in terms of how much freedom will they have? Why can't a 16 year old vote? Why can't a 12 year old vote? Right. Because they're drinking from the same CNN right. as the adults are. Yeah. So uh, do we feel as though adults have secret knowledge? Mm -hmm. And I remember reading Neil Postman, NYU professor in the late eighties. I guess I was interested then mm -hmm. um, a book called the end of education. Another called the disappearance of childhood mm -hmm. in which he pointed out that the adult world is no longer so secret and yeah. children are no longer seen, but not heard. Yeah. Once you do all that, you got to accommodate the changes throughout. You can't just say, yeah, you can do that, but not in school. Right. Because the kids aren't buying it. Right. And now with all the freedom that they're getting in terms of the way they organize their time and they're realizing adults have let them down. Mm -hmm. We're no longer in a situation where they believe that adults will fix climate change. They know that we're not going to do it. They, they are looking at school going, wow, you guys really screwed up this pandemic thing. You did yeah. not have control over it. Mm -hmm. So they're realizing if they don't do it themselves, they're in a terrible position. Yeah. It's so fascinating. I, to, yeah. So right? just to clarify too, the podcast is more a cross section of folks who understand some aspect of education and some perspective on how we may reinvent it. And then Kids on, Kids on Earth is more specifically talking to to kids from around the globe. So like both of those things are happening concurrently and you're involved in all of that. Is that correct? Yes. 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 It, it, the difference being I'm very much behind the camera in um, on Kids on Earth because I want to give the kids the stage. Yeah. And on Reinventing School, which is mm -hmm. www.reinventing.school. Yep. Uh, the my objective is to very much be in the conversation I because I want to ask the question, but also as often as possible, we have students as well as adult professionals on the show because their voices, they're yeah. the ones who are doing this now. For sure. So I want to hear what they have to say. It's not yeah. as, as easy to book kids as to book yes. professionals, but mm -hmm. we've been able to do it quite a lot. So yeah. we probably have 50 or 60 kids, maybe 40 or 50 kids on the show. That's awesome. Um, so we're really pushing hard on that. Yeah. Um, and, and then we'll the be doing several about social activism and learning. I think that was going to be three of the November episodes following a group of positive psychology episodes awesome. that we're just finishing up. So we're trying to really make this meaty and really thought provoking. It sounds it. And then the book is based on just your perspective on. I think that my writing at this point is more for me trying to figure out how to explain things to myself and to yeah. organize it. Mm -hmm. But at some point, there are three different books that may emerge out of this. Mm -hmm. One of them is the kids on earth, a look at kids in the 21st century. And that's largely based on the hundreds of interviews I've done and mm -hmm. all the insights that I've gathered. Yep. But from there, I started organizing it into how they learn and families and different aspects. And I realized more of this is about putting power into the hands of children and teenagers. Mm -hmm. And so the whole world in their hands, it's that the book, one book's evolved into that. I may mm -hmm. end up doing one or both, but now with the school thing, yeah. I, that's a separate project. I don't know if that's a book or not, whatever it is, it's 50 pages sitting on my computer that I add to, and I've been doing that for about six weeks. So I don't know whether it's one book, two books, three books, no books, just my own education, something mm -hmm. to talk about, basis for speeches. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter. So it'll be it it'll turn out to be whatever the marketplace wants it to be and mm -hmm. whatever is most useful. Yeah. And but and then the podcast has been around and it's a video, it's a video interview series. The, vi so the video interview. Yeah. yeah. And that was triggered mainly by the pandemic and the yes. pandemic response. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So March, we're all going really. So this is, this, we're really not going to be able to leave our houses or we're not going to be able to shop for food or we're not going to be able to have toilet paper, whatever, yeah. the, whatever the crazy was. And then it's, it's April. And like everybody else, I'm watching CNN like every minute to try yeah. to absorb what the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. And by about the second week in April, I'm like, okay, I can't do this. I have to do something. I've, mm. I've been able to do things throughout my life. I need to do something about this. Yeah. I need to be helpful. I need to be helping other people. I need to 
I, convene the tribunal. Yeah. Whatever it is we have to do, yeah. I, I have to it's do it. It's a bat signal. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, I, like yeah. something. Do something. So that's when I'm thinking, I can't really get out and interview kids because I can't travel. Mm -hmm. Tried a little bit of Zoom interviews with kids, and it's okay, but it's not yeah. the same as being there. So I'm not ecstatic about that. I mm -hmm. think there's better way. So I'm thinking, what's the area that I need to know the most about or where I can be most helpful. So I think school is going to be a disaster. This is yeah. in, in late April. And so I'm you, talking to my wife who and you're works talking, school. And this is K-12 mainly is the focus. Yeah, but also, for... but also uh, uh, higher ed. Okay. Uh, some. Yep. Um, I'm like, I don't think people are going to go back. I don't think they're going to want to go back. I think we're going to lose a large number of teachers. Yeah. I don't think the school districts are going to have any idea how to handle this. And then I started thinking, and if the economy's crashing, that means the state funding is going to be a problem. Yep. The federal government will prop them up for a while, but right. ultimately this is becomes a local problem. What do mm -hmm. you do if you don't have connectivity? And I'm thinking, I can't imagine that most kids in the United States have everything they need to do. Yeah. Like, they don't have fast broadband or if right. they do, they may not have multiple devices. And if they yeah. do, they may not have a quiet place to work. So sure. all this is in April. I'm thinking this is a much bigger mess than anybody is talking about right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And I need to get to this. So we got in touch with Randy Weingarten mm. and said, you are our first guest. Oh, cool. So we had Randy, we had uh, Zeke Emanuel, who happens to be one of the provosts at UPenn, who's on MSNBC all the time, mm -hmm. a public health expert yes, as well yes. as a higher mm -hmm. education expert, mm -hmm. and the CEO of the Baltimore City School District. Yep. So the three of them, we went at it. I'm thinking, oh, wow. And I'm just guiding the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, What about this and what about that for a mm -hmm. full hour mm -hmm. on video? Mm -hmm. And we went, you know what? This is good. I wonder how we're going to pay for all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So then we started looking at the economics. I had Andreas Schleicher on from OECD, who just knows more about the statistics of global education than anybody on earth. Yeah. And, and a few other people who so had a local and global angle. And then from there, we've done episodes on friendship, mm. on hope. Mm. on cyber attacks, on prison behind bars, which was came out of the Ken Burns organization, mm. um, which was easily the most inspiring episode we've wow. done Yeah, um, with people who are getting college degrees and reading books that I still don't think I'm old enough to read. And they just, they were marvelous. And we had one of the, one of the former inmates who now works for Ford Foundation. Oh, wow. And he was a very articulate spokesperson for why education matters and yeah. how they went about it and why they took it as seriously as they did. Mm -hmm. Just a really wide range of, of guests from very different parts of the education yeah. and related industries, because I don't think it exists in a, as a vacuum. I think that it's really the whole community has yeah. to participate. Mm -hmm. So I've taken that seriously, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. We've had a number of international guests and we'll have more. Yeah. And well. what's the name of this again, just for it's, our listeners? Yeah, it's called Reinventing School. And it's okay. got the funny URL of www.reinventing.school. Awesome. Yeah. But it's been an absolute pleasure to do this. We're mm -hmm. recording the 26th episode and I've got the next like six or seven episodes just about book. So yeah. next week we're doing state superintendents this mm -hmm. tomorrow. And then the following week, I really want to get a sense of, so what's a virus again and how do mm. viruses work and how do they propagate? And if yeah. they do, how do we control them? Yeah, what's there's the there's, there's our really RNAs work? involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah all that. So yeah. I have three top scientists uh, mm. on the medical side mm -hmm. who are joining us to not talk about the political, not talk about masks, yep. not talk about the public hygiene stuff that we've heard a lot about. But like, I, I really want to know, is this the only virus we're going to yep. have? And right, if, right. so if we want to think about this long term and we're not, are we not going to have vaccines that make schools safe for two or three years, which is what I believe? Right. If that's true, then we need to plan for that. Right. And, yeah. and, and and take all the nonsense and the politics and the school districts and all that out of it. Let's just understand, like, wh how does this work? And yeah. what do we know and what don't we know? And this format, because I'm not on CNN, yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. doing a half hour radio show with commercial. Like, I'm not doing any of those yeah. things. I can just spend an hour in relaxed conversation and ask the questions that I think other people are curious about, but always with the idea that, listen, if we don't figure this out, 
then nobody does. If you guys don't know the answer, that's a really scary thing. Yeah. So let's figure out what we know. It's good to know what we don't know because then we can make plans from that too. But the planning yeah. assumptions right now are all over the place. Mm -hmm. that if you're the parent of an eight-year-old, the smartest thing you can do is just teach them something at home. And if you want to, maybe I'll actually publish this curriculum. You can use mine. Yeah. But I'm much more concerned that the kid actually knows how his body works than I am that he, he can do polynomials. Right. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've gotten this wrong, and I think mm. this is an opportunity to correct it. Yeah, fascinating. And, yeah, fascinating. I, mean, I, yeah. I think. doesn't mean I know. I think this. Yeah, yeah. And I'll learn more as we go. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic stuff. Really uh, amazing uh backstory for you too. So thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Uh, and if they want to follow you, are you, are you out there on uh, any yeah, of the, the, the easiest thing to do apart from going to visit kids on earth mm -hmm. and to visit reinventing school is I have a website and I usually keep it pretty up to date. I have a blog and a bunch of other things. So yeah. it's just hblumenthal.com. Awesome. H-B-L-U-M-E-N-T-H-A-L.com. Yeah. So, uh, and there's always contact forms and stuff. So if people want to find me, I'm not that difficult to find. Yeah, that's awesome. And thanks so much for your time. Before we let you go, I always love to ask my guests, and I feel like we've talked about a ton of these things already, but what's really capturing your imagination these days? Something we haven't necessarily discussed so far. What's really activating your uh, creative juices in terms of thinking about the future, thinking about learning? It sounds like you're drinking from the fire hose, so it may be hard to, to sort this into one or a few trends that you're tracking. But anything for our listeners to be on the lookout for, things you've noticed that you think are worth paying attention to? Yeah. Can I go backwards for that? So I Please. just finished reading, and I'm probably rereading, John Holt, a book called Why Children Learn, which is absolutely a classic. Mm. In, in, so I remember reading it, or at least browsing it in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. He is so spot on mm. about how we learn, how young kids, he's very observant. He think about Fred Rogers, but as somebody who is paying attention to kids and reporting about young kids and reporting back. Yeah. He, that's been enormously influential to me. And then on the other side of the, the age spectrum is a book called Teen 2.0 by Robert Epstein. Okay. Um, and he basically traces the whole history of adolescence and how we've managed to not only get it wrong, but make life impossible. Yeah for people who are between 13 and 18, 19, 20. Yeah. So reading both of those in parallel, I think has had more of an impact on me than learning about what is GPT 3.0, which are three, what G, I think I got it right. Artificial reality language. Yeah. So I'm looking at that going, cool. It, yeah. The software can actually level up or down reading levels. I love that. Yeah. But is that more meaningful than how, a baby learns language. Now I think I want to go with the baby learning language. So thank yeah. you, John Holt, right? Yeah, yeah. Fascinating uh, stuff. Any concluding thoughts, Howard? It's been a, a wonderful conversation. We'd love to have you back too. It's a, just, it sounds like we're just scratching the surface of a really extensive career, tapping into many different dimensions of learning, which is why I'm sure your new show, Reinventing School, is fascinating. But any parting thoughts as we wrap here? I don't think what I'm doing is substantially different from what I was doing when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. it, for me, all of this has been play. Mm -hmm. If it's not fun, I don't necessarily want to do it. But my definition of fun is a, a little on the broad side. Yeah. It's always been, let's get a small group of people together and we'll do something cool. Yeah. So that's what Carmen was. That's what time travel was. That's what all of these things are. So for me, learning and working and play are all in the same very tight circle. They're mm -hmm. all, for me, they're almost synonymous. Mm -hmm. And if you approach it that way, everything becomes a pleasure. Yeah. So it hasn't been every day like that, but it's been the vast majority of days like that. And I'm really grateful for it. I know how lucky I've been, and I know how lucky I am to have had so many wonderful people in my life doing all these crazy things that for one reason or another, people have paid some attention to, and I'm hoping we continue. Yeah, that's awesome. We feel very fortunate having you on as a guest. So Howard Blumenthal, uh, really storied history. Check out reinventing.school. Check out Kids on Earth. Howard's a really interesting thinker. He's someone I've been following uh, of late, and I would encourage our listeners to do the same. Of course, thank you for listening to Trending in Education. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend, rate us, love us, share us out there in the world. We'll be back again soon. Thanks as always for listening.